This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by SpyCloud. Stolen data circulating on the criminal underground is fuel for data breaches, account takeover, ransomware attacks, and online fraud. Your biggest security risk might be a breach or malware infection outside of your control that exposes the data of your users. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data sourced from the dark web that power solutions that proactively protect over 3 billion employees and consumer accounts worldwide. Learn how to make recaptured data your best defense at spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. Unrest in Iran finds expression in cyberspace. Albania explains its reasons for severing relations with Iran. Cybercrime in the hybrid war. Rick Howard on risk forecasting with data scientists. Dave Bittner sits down with Dr. Biliana Lilly to discuss her new book, Russian Information Warfare, Assault on Democracies in the Cyber Wild West. And there seems to have been arrest in the Uber and Rockstar breaches. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Trey Hester, filling in for Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Monday, September 26, 2022. Protests in Iran continue, the New York Times and others report, and they've been particularly sharp in Kurdish regions. The proximate cause of the unrest was the death of a young woman in the custody of the morality police. Masa Amini, 22, had been arrested on charges for violating hijab regulations. Many of the protests have been led by women, and some smaller cities are said to be outside of effective government control. The Washington Post's coverage include video of street violence. Tehran has responded with force, but also by imposing sharp restrictions on online activity. The record reports that the government has organized outages of mobile networks, WhatsApp, and Instagram. The record also reports that the anonymous hacktivist collective last week disrupted some Iranian government websites. On Friday, in a gesture intended to offer support to Iran's dissidents, the U.S. Treasury Department relaxed sanctions in ways calculated to make it easier for U.S. tech firms to offer Iranians greater access to online communication. Iran's Green Movement of 2009 and 2010 which shook the regime, although it ultimately fell short of revolutionary success, is instructive here. That movement took place when Twitter was relatively young, and the dissenters made innovative and effective use of what was still a new and unfamiliar platform. It seems likely that Treasury hopes to remove any barriers sanctions might impose on such self-organizing opposition to the rulers of Tehran. The Washington Post this week interviewed Albania's Prime Minister Edi Rama, on his government's decision to sever diplomatic relations with Iran over Tehran's large-scale cyber attack against Albanian IT infrastructure. Rama told the Post, quote, Based on the investigation, the scale of the attack was such that the aim behind it was to completely destroy our infrastructure back to the full paper age, and at the same time, wipe out all of our data. Our sense now is, first, that they didn't succeed in destroying infrastructure. Services are back. Second, data. Yes, they took some, but practically not of any particular relevance, end quote. He characterized the cyber attacks as aggression, not as destructive, of course, as bombing, but of comparable intent, and comparably inadmissible under international norms. Observers continue to expect a renewed offensive from Russia in cyberspace, but so far, that hasn't materialized. What is being seen, News24 and others report, is some apparently financially motivated celebrity doxing by Russophone gangs. In Ukraine itself, the Security Service of Ukraine reports having taken down a gang that was responsible for compromising almost 30 million accounts and earning roughly $380,000 in the process. Bleeping Computer reads this as accounts belonging to 30 million individuals. The SBU says the hoods it took down were working for the Russians. On Friday, the City of London Police tweeted, quote, On the evening of Thursday, September 22, 2022, the City of London Police arrested a 17-year-old in Oxfordshire on suspicion of hacking. 
as part of an investigation supported by the NCA UK's National Cybercrime Unit. End quote. The police have been relatively closed-mouthed about the arrest and haven't publicly connected it with either the Uber or the Rockstar Games incident. As The Verge points out, however, circumstantially, the alleged crime looks like the Uber and Rockstar hacks, and the suspect looks like a lapsus operator. The Hacker News offers some informed speculation that the youth arrested was responsible for the Uber and Rockstar incidents. Without revealing the hacker's real identity, Flashpoint reports that the hacker, known as Teapot Uber Hacker, was outed in an underground online forum, but the security firm urges caution in accepting the doxing at face value. Flashpoint reviewed what it found in the, quote, online illicit forum, end quote, and reported evidence that the person responsible for the Uber and Grand Theft Auto hacks, quote, On the day that the original post was made, Flashpoint analysts found the teapot Uber hacker's real-world identity had been outed on an online illicit forum, and that thread titled, The Person Who Hacked GTA 6 and Uber is Orion. The administrator for that forum claimed that teapot Uber hacker was the same individual who had allegedly hacked Microsoft and owned Docspin. Additionally, the administrator linked teapot Uber hacker to other aliases like White and Breachbase, and stated he was a member of Lapsus. While the tactics, techniques, and procedures employed by teapot Uber hacker are consistent with Lapsus, these communities will often make false claims against one another. Flashpoint analysts identified previous doxes where the content may vary on the same individual. These are typically curated by individuals within these communities and should be treated with a healthy degree of skepticism. End quote. Well, if it is the same young person, a youthful recidivist, we'll repeat the same thing we said in the spring. Child, child, these wild ways of yours will break your mother's heart. Coming up after the break, Rick Howard on risk forecasting with data scientists, and Dave Bittner sits down with Dr. Biliana Lilly to discuss her new book, Russian Information Warfare, Assault on Democracies in the Cyber Wild West. Stick around. And now a word from our sponsors, Know Before. So what's a con game? It's a fraud that works by getting the victim to misplace their confidence in the con artist. In the world of security, we call confidence tricks social engineering. And as our sponsors at Know Before can tell you, human error is how most organizations get compromised. Where there's human contact, there can be con games. It's important to build the kind of security culture in which your employees are enabled to make smart security decisions. To do that, they need new school security awareness training. See how your security culture stacks up against Know Before's free phishing test. Get it at knowbefore.com slash phishing test. That's knowbefore.com slash phishing test. And we thank Know Before for sponsoring our show. And now a word from our sponsor, Collide. Collide is an endpoint security solution that uses the most powerful untapped resource in IT, end users. Legacy device management tools like MDMs force disruptive agents onto employee devices that slow performance and treat privacy as an afterthought. Collide does things differently. Instead of forcing changes, Collide notifies your team via Slack when their devices are insecure and gives them step-by-step instructions to solve the issue. Collide can help you build a culture where everyone contributes to security because everyone understands how and why to do it. For IT admins, Collide provides a single dashboard that lets you monitor the security of your entire fleet, whether they're running on Mac, Windows, or Linux. That visibility makes it easier to prove compliance to your auditors, customers, and leadership. You can meet your compliance goals by putting users first. Visit collide.com slash cyberwire daily to find out how. That's K O L I D E dot com slash cyberwire daily. And we thank Collide for sponsoring our show. Dr. Biliana Lilly is Director of Security Intelligence and Geostrategy at Krebs Stamos Group. She's author of the newly released book, Russian Information Warfare, Assault on Democracies in the Cyber Wild West. 
the elections in 2016 happened and we saw Russia's interference in the elections. And we started to learn more and more about the different activities that were associated with Russia's interference during the elections. And we saw, if you remember, Dave, there were two APTs, APT28 and APT29. They breached the networks of the DNC, the Democratic National Committee. They exfiltrated data strategically as the election season was unfolding. And at that time, it seemed to me like the U.S. government was not prepared to address that particular interference in the hack and leak operation. That's how we learned to call it afterwards. And we were rather reactive in our responses and in our management of the situation. And what's even more interesting is before the elections and after the elections, we learned a lot more about the other activities that the Russian government has been sponsoring, like the disinformation operations, the trolls and bots on social media, the troll farms in St. Petersburg and other locations. We also learned that the Russian government has sponsored rallies in different states throughout the United States for and against the different candidates. So the range of activities was vast, and we didn't have a clear picture as we were going into the election season in 2016. So I wanted to understand after that experience, where else has the Russian government used similar tactics to interfere in democratic processes? And what can we learn from them so that next time this happens in the U.S., we can be better prepared to address it? Well, how do you describe the current state of Russian information warfare? I mean, how how do they go about doing the things they do? That's, That's a great question. So it's definitely evolved. When I discuss what information warfare is in essence, I always refer to the Russian doctrine of information warfare. They published a document in 2011 where they provided an official definition of what information war or information warfare is. The the term that we roughly translated as information warfare, but in Russian, the term also may mean information struggle. It's informazione protivaborstva. And it is described as constant confrontation between states. And that confrontation is conducted during war and peace for the purposes of eroding the decision-making apparatus of the adversary and eroding its capacity to conduct command and control operations. And it's also conducted for the for the purposes of inflicting damage on information systems. So there is an element of using cyber operations to inflict damage on your networks and your systems, but also using psychological operations to inflict damage on the mind of your adversary, on the decision-making apparatus, but also on the population. So those are the elements of information warfare that the Russian, that are the core in Russia's modern version of warfare. But then in addition to that, there are a lot of Russian military scholars that have tried to describe, okay, how do we really operationalize this theoretical concept on the ground? And in addition to psychological operations and cyber operations, some scholars argue that to conduct information warfare, we have to also consider the associated operations such as sponsoring of protests, coup d'etats, assassinations, economic sanctions, political pressure, and all of those activities together are associated with information warfare and help the Russian government to conduct it. So this is how I would describe the term. And how do they compare to their peers when we look around you know, the globe, other folks who are, in, who are engaged in these sorts of things? How does Russia rank? I think Russia has a very good um, culture of already conducting spe- specifically the types of hack and leak operations that we saw in 2016 and the point where in the way they integrate cyber operations and strategic messaging campaigns or disinformation, because they have units that do this together, like, for example, the GRU Russian military intelligence. And they are very good at doing that. And we have some examples in Ukraine. We have other examples in countries outside of the United States as well. And in comparison to other other nation states, I've from what I have read, the Russian government tends to use cyber operations and information and inf- in disinformation altogether as information warfare to try to inflict damage on the adversary, while other threat actors or other states use similar techniques like cognitive warfare in the Chinese case um, and others to conduct damage or to influence more regional actors, while the Russian government uses its tools to exert pressure on or uh, influence on actors that are much farther away from its its territory. And in the Russian case, they use it a lot for political purposes, 
while in other cases we have political purposes, also economic espionage that is linked to those particular campaigns. I would say the Russians so far are probably the best at conducting this type of modern version of warfare. In the book, you introduce a, a framework that you refer to as the chaos model. Can you describe to us what, what goes into that? Sure. So chaos stands for cyber, hype in media, and associated operations. And with that model, I wanted to visualize in one simple figure all the different activities that the Russian government conducts during one information warfare campaign. And the purpose was so that we have a template that we can use to record each cyber or each each information warfare campaign and to compare and contrast between the different campaigns that the Russian government is involved in. And in this way, we can see whether there are any patterns, whether there are any deficiencies, and we can be able to address them better as we build Russia's playbook across different cases. So with cyber, with the first two letters, cyber and basically the first two letters of chaos, cyber and hype, that stand for cyber and hype, I'm trying to capture chronologically all the cyber operations that have taken place during one information warfare campaign. And with hype, I'm trying to capture the volume of media articles in Russian state-sponsored media outlets that are available to the targeted population through which the Russian government is conducting its strategic messaging operations. So I try to basically... um, assess whether that volume changes as the information warfare campaign progresses. And then the associated operations are political, military, social, um, and economic activities that the Russian government has supported to achieve the same objectives in the general information warfare campaign. So that's what CAL stands for. You know, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and the war there, I think folks who keep an eye on these things have certainly felt like they've learned a lot about Russia's capabilities or shortcomings when it comes to that. Have there been any revelations when it comes to information warfare, things that we've learned from what what they have and have not been able to do in this particular campaign? Absolutely. There is a lot that's coming out of um, the past six months. And I would say, first of all, I don't think cyber operations have been ineffective. We have some reports that suggest that I think cyber operations have been very effective in achieving some of the strategic objectives that I were set to achieve. In the beginning, there were two massive waves of DDoS attacks against banks in, in Ukraine, as well as uh, government structures. We have um, a lot of, um, we have uh, Viasat technologies that were um, rendered inoperable for a certain period of time that affected the command and control of the Ukrainian military. We have Industroyer 2 that could have wreaked a lot of havoc. We have a lot of uh, new wiper malware that still there is a risk of it spilling across the borders. It's not as bad as not Petya in 2017, but we're still facing a risk of this spilling out of Ukraine's borders and affecting other industries and other countries. So I would say In many ways, we have seen a range of cyber operations that have been quite significant. I believe Viktor Zhora, um, Ukraine's cyber tsar, one of the the Ukrainian officials who is telling us a lot about the the situation on the ground and um, specifically how warfare is conducted in cyberspace in Ukraine at the moment, he said that there were about 1,600 significant cyber operations that have taken place so far. And... Mm -hmm. I think what we have to remember is that information warfare, very roughly defined as strategic messaging and cyber operations, it's only one component of warfare. And right now what we are seeing in Ukraine is a large-scale war on the territory of a European country, and this hasn't happened since the Second World War. We have tanks, we have artillery, we have soldiers, we have massive battles happening it's this is where the focus should be not so much on cyber and cyber is is in this particular case it plays a supportive function and so far i believe it has showed that it has been effective where it's it's been needed dr biliana lily is director of security intelligence and geo strategy at krebs stamos group her latest book is titled russian information warfare assault on democracies in the cyber wild west
And it is always my pleasure to welcome back to the show Rick Howard. He is the CyberWire's chief security officer, also our chief analyst uh, and bottle washer. And uh, <laughs> Rick, I was looking at the call sheet this morning and I discovered that season 10 of CSO Perspectives Pro is coming to an end this week. It There's is. much wailing and gnashing of teeth about that. Uh, we're going to have to wait an entire month for season 11 to start. And that is a shame because you and your army of interns have really hit your stride this season, in my opinion. I appreciate that, Dave. Yes, and we may have to double the interns' bread and water rations down in the underwater sanctum sanctorum, okay? Because, you know, they deserve it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So this season, we kind of blew by our 100th episode. Uh, we covered another tool uh, from the MITRE ATT&CK folks called Attack Flow, which I really like. We talked about the FinTech ecosystem, and then we had a detailed discussion about two first principles, zero trust tactics, privileged access management and crisis planning. And we finished up with a mini four-episode series of on forecasting cyber risk that I'm really proud of, right? And this last episode in the series, I talked with two data scientists from a company called Scientia about the current state of cyber risk forecasting. Uh, their names are David Saversky and Wade Baker, who, Dave, I think you may know him. He was one of the founders of the Verizon Data Breach Report many years ago. Oh. Um, and so these two guys have some risk forecasting cred, as they say. So yeah. uh, it's, it's a good interview. Well, I see the name of this episode is Two Risk Forecasting Data Scientists and Rick Walk Into a Bar. That seems appropriate. I, perfect title there. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly what it is. <laughs> well, congratulations on putting to bed another season of CSO Perspectives Pro. Uh, what is going on on the public version this week? Yeah, this episode is from the November of last year, and it's the inaugural episode of the Rick the Toolman series where I explain in simple terms that even senior security executives like me can understand the tools that their InfoSec teams are using on a regular basis. I just want to note here that Rick the Toolman sounds suspiciously like Tim the Toolman Taylor from the <laughs> long-running 90s TV show Home Improvement. Is, is that what we're going for here? Yeah, it looks like I've been had. Yes, uh, I <laughs> myself was also a big fan of the series. And the way the show star Tim Allen used his ape-like grunts to express his confusion or joy or whatever he's talking about, that kind of appealed to me. And I just, uh, I'll just say that I may appropriate those grunts in the Rick the Toolman series, you know, just saying. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. so for this episode, we're explaining one of my favorite tools, uh, the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Hmm. Well, lastly, what is the phrase of the week on your Word Notes podcast? We're covering a little InfoSec meat and potatoes, okay? Nothing sexy here, but this week, the phrase is intrusion detection systems. This device has been a staple of the security stack since the 1990s, and it was invented by the great computer scientist and cybersecurity pioneer, Dr. Dorothy Denning, back in the 1980s. So you don't want to miss that. All right, well, we can check it all out. Uh, CyberWire Pro is on our website, thecyberwire.com. Rick Howard, thanks for joining us. Thank you, sir. We want to thank our sponsor, Keeper Security, for helping make this episode possible. Keeper is the world's most secure password manager for organizations. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Guru Prakash, Liz Irvin, Rachel Gelfin, Kim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Flecky, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Trey Hester, filling in for Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Hi, I'm Gina Johnson. 
contributing writer and operations associate at The Cyberwire. After a two-year hiatus, we are so excited to be able to bring together women in the industry to celebrate and empower each other. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out in cybersecurity, we are thrilled to invite you to join us on October 20th, 2022 at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. for an evening of networking and camaraderie across the industry with women in different points in their careers. Visit thecyberwire.com slash WCS to find out more or request an invitation. Hope to see you there.